Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the part two of Mapping Crime Data in R. My name is Nadia Kenner. I'm a research associate with the UK Data Service, and um, we'll be running the live code demonstration today. Yeah, the code demonstration is split into three main topics, as mentioned yesterday. We'll start by briefly exploring our crime data, um, making some basic maps. We'll then move on to exploring shapefiles and how these how we can use these to combine our crime data. And then we'll move on to um, adding another data set known as the census data set, where we look at uh, the differences between mapping crime rate and mapping crime count. Uh, given the time, we'll also look at some extra topics, or I'll leave this kind of just, just for you to explore, but there's um, some really useful information about binning and about um, mapping using Google APIs, GG Maps. But yeah, given the time, we'll see we'll see where we're at with that. Um, and yeah, just a little little rundown. I'll quickly demonstrate how you can get the R project available on your computer if you haven't yet done so. I won't spend too long on this. Maybe just about five minutes, <clears throat> just so I make sure that everyone has access to it um, because the data, the code, and some extra information is, is all available on that link. So I'll go ahead and just quickly show how to do this. Um, so this is the repo for the UK Data Service Crime Dragon R. There are three workshops, December, February, and June. And in order to clone this re repo, all you need to do is click this big green code button, copy the, uh, the link here, which is a HTTPS link, and then you want to move back over to your R studios. Um, <clears throat> assuming you've just opened this, opened this up, you should have an empty, empty R studio. So don't worry about what you see at the moment. But all you want to do is click file, click new project. Don't worry about that. Uh, this will open up a option to create a new project. You then want to click version control. Um, GitHub is a is a version control system. It basically allows you to work on code at the same time as other people, um, allowing for like better reproducibility. And then you want to click Git. From here, all you need to do is paste that URL link that we copied from GitHub. This will automatically create the project directory name. And then all you need to do is save it somewhere on your computer. Um, and that, that's it. I would advise clicking open in a new session uh, just because if you have anything else open, you don't want to override or cause, cause a crash because all loves to do that. And then that's, that's it. So as soon as you create that new project, everything that you've seen on the GitHub will be available on your own computer. And it means you can get involved at the same time as I am. Um, I'm not going to do this because I already have it up, but yeah. And within this GitHub account, we have uh, four main files. We have the preliminary, pre preliminary tasks, which indicate uh, how to set up your working directory, so make sure that's done. And then we have all the packages and um, yeah, all the packages that we need. So those are the two things you just need to make sure you have done: set the working directory and install the packages. Um, and then from there, we're going to be working through topic one, topic two, and our topic three. Uh, so yeah, I suppose I'm just going to give it two minutes just to let uh, make sure that everyone's installed these packages because I realized I forgot to mention this yesterday. And I know that it could take a while to get packages downloaded on your computer. So yeah, just give it two minutes while, while that happens. Um, Oh, yeah. Hopefully everyone knows how to set your working directory. It was it was set as a um, prerequisite for this course. So hopefully no one's struggling or, or lagging too far behind. Someone has asked, it tells me to download Git. Sorry, where should I download it? Yes, you should have a, you need Git downloaded on your computer in order to then create a GitHub account. 
where you can then access the code. Um, and we're going to start to go through the code. We we'll start with topic one, which looks at exploring our crime data. Um, this first bit, this first line of code, which lists the RM list equals LS, that, that's not necessarily relevant. That was just a code that clears your global environment. So that was just more for me, but I thought I'd leave it in. So yes, first thing you want to do is load your packages. As I'm using um, an R markdown file, you can click the little green arrows that will load all the codes in the chunks at the same time. Now that's all loaded, we can go ahead and download our crime data set. We are using the crime data set from um, the police.uk. This is open recorded police statistics, so it's freely available to anyone. And we're gonna be looking at the years August 2020 to August 2021 from Surrey. No reason, but um, just a random error that shows. Uh, there are, I've included a Google doc in how to download the data in, the, in this data folder, but you can just use this bit of code here that will automatically down this, download this data set for you. So we are gonna read in the um, month of August, 2020. So what we're gonna do is call on a new variable or new object, sorry, called crime, use the assignment operator and the function read underscore CSV and include that data set from the data folder, which can be found here. So we're looking at the month 2020-08, right there. And that will automatically read in that data set. It is a CSV file, and there it is. And I'm also using the function uh, clean names from the janitor package just to make the names uh, all lowercase. So it's easier to use for, for data manipulation. So we can run that code. And as you can see, we have our crime data set loaded into our environment. We have 8,912 observations and 12 variables. Our first step is just to kind of explore this data set to see what we're actually dealing with, to see what type of variables we have. To do this, we can use the head uh, function. And what this does is list the first, I want to say six rows, of data, yeah, six would be right, um, right there, and all the columns. We have the crime ID, which is not really relevant to us. We have the month, we have where it was reported, where the crime falls within. We have the longitude and latitude, which will become very important to us. And we have the location, the LSO code, the LSO name, the crime type, the last outcome category and context, which just reads as NA. For, for some context, the LSOA name, that stands for the lower layer super output area. And this is a type of um, type of type of ward. It's a type of government statistics that helps identify smaller areas within, within Surrey in this instance. You can also use the glimpse function to, to view the data set. And it reads it out like this, which is a bit better. Um, but yeah, choices, choices up to you to, to use what you want. Um, yeah, we're going to move on. So as I mentioned yesterday, we talked about points, lines, and polygons as a type of spatial data. Um, in our instance, our coordinate variables, which would be the latitude and the longitude, are known as that point data. Here are the variables for that. They indicate one point where a crime has happened. We then have the location variable, which represents the line. This is normally defined by a street or a junction. So here we see on or near slash park slash open space. This is a type of um, line data. And then lastly, we have the LSOA name, which represents a polygon. And this is what we will be using um, as our unit measure for, for this, for this uh, webinar. Now, we currently have a data frame that is not spatial. Our studios does not know that this is a spatial data frame. Yes, it contains these points, lines, and polygons, but currently it just treats it as like a tibble. It just treats it as a very basic data frame. So in order to um, work with all the like the functions that, that come within R, we need to tell R that this is a spatial data frame. 
And we can do this by assigning it as a simple features. Now, a simple features is a, is a really common R language. And it basically just allows you to handle and manipulate those points, lines, and polygons. Um, there is more information if you'd like to read up on by yourself about what exactly uh, simple features are. But <clears throat> what we're going to do is um, assign your longitude and latitude variables a to a simple features coordinate. And I'm going to show you exactly how to do that. Um, as mentioned yesterday, we talked about coordinate reference systems. So yeah, we talked about coordinate reference systems as, a, as a, like a spatial reference, right, which defines a, a specific map projection. Um, there are thousands of coordinate reference systems. And yesterday I mentioned that the most common is the WGS84. There is also the BNG, um, which is identified as the British National Grid. Now, with each coordinate reference system, this is where it gets, you know, even more confusing. There's always there's always more context, but each coordinate reference system is assigned an ESPG identifier. Um, and I can't quite remember what ESPG stands for. I want to say European. Ah, lost me. If anyone knows, you can leave that in the chat. But um, yeah, each CR each CRS has a unique ESP identifier, which allows you to um, assign a non-spatial data frame into a spatial data frame. The BNG ESPG is 2,000 or 20,700. The WGS 84 uses the ESPG 4R26. Um, these are kind of like the three most common systems. So I've left them in here just, just for your context. But um, yeah, we can go ahead and basically change our data frame into a simple features by including an ESPG identifier. Now, I also mentioned yesterday that if your data frame contains longitude or latitude, then the WGS84 is the system that you would use. So we'll be looking at the 4326 identifier. So let's go ahead and have a look at how we can identify whether a data frame um, is assigned a coordinate reference system. We can use the function st underscore crs to do so. So if we run this, we'll see that we have na. There is no current coordinate reference system set, which tells us that this data frame is non-spatial. Non so in order to assign one, in order to turn this data frame spatial, we can use the st underscore as sf, which stands for the simple features. I am assigning this to a new variable called sf just to make things a little clearer so we're not overriding the original data set. We call on our crime data set, um, use the chords function, and in our instance, our um, reference are like geographical variables are the longitude and latitude. And the CRS is a 4326. We also just make false the, the NA. So if we run this, nothing really happens, but you'll see that we have our new data set added in the SF and we have one less variable. And this is because it's combined that longitude and latitude into a official geometry. So to check this, we can run the SC underscore CRS function again. And now you'll see that an ESPG identifier has been assigned to a data set, which is excellent. Um, so let's have a look at what's changed in the data set. We can run the, the head function again. We scroll over to the end. <clears throat> you'll see that the longitude and latitude variables have been removed, and we now have a geometry variable. And this will allow us to make maps within um, ggplot and the other packages. Uh, just for some reference, if you had northings and eastings, I realized that this was a question yesterday. Uh, typically the northings and eastings would use the um, BNG identifier, that is the British National Grid. So you would change this to northing and eastings, and then you would put in the um, CRS, which is the 277000. And that will make your northings and eastings into one variable for your geometry. 
Right. Um, now we've gone ahead and done that, we can start to map the point data, which is where it gets where it gets fun. So now we have an official simple features object that is an official spatial object that contains some uh, point level data, right? So how can we go ahead and create a, a basic point map? How can we point um, the crimes in Surrey? For this, we're going to be using uh, ggplot and the geom sf function. And all we do is call on our data set named sf, which was just created earlier. Now, if we run this, we will get a, just get rid of that bit. We have this cool looking image, which, um, sorry, which uh, highlights the shape of Surrey and all the points of crime that have happened within the year of August, 2020. Now this, this looks all right, but it's not that readable. It's not much we could do with this. So let's start to add some more context to these maps. One way to do this is to color the different crime types. And we can do this by adding a specific aesthetic using the poll function. So um, all you need to do is add another bracket and supply the, crime, the variable crime type from the SF object to coal. Now, if we run that, give it a couple seconds because this is the issue with maps, they just take a while. Brilliant. And now we have a bit more of an interesting map. We have one that identifies all the different crime, crime types associated with some sort of colour, right? Um, although obviously there's a lot of overlap in this, and we're going to talk about how we can. Um, limit that variation a little later on. Another way to like spice up the map could be to add a reference map. Remember we uh, talked about this yesterday. Um, a reference map also is known as the base map. So what it basically does is just adds a, a like a, um, a normal map behind what we have. And we do this by using the annotation map tile function. And that's the only change to that code it's just an additional line where we've added this function. And this is from the uh, GG spatial package, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, I think it is. Yeah, GG spatial package for reference. So if you run this, again, it's going to take a while, especially because we're using a base map. And then we have we have now have our um, reference map added to our crime type. So this is just a little bit more more readable. And now we know um, you know we have Surrey located on a map and not just on a grid. All right. Um, now let's just say you were interested in looking at one type of crime. That map there listed all twelve crimes at time, but maybe that's not your interest. So in this instance, I'm gonna show you how to subset for just one type of crime. And we're gonna be looking at antisocial behavior. Now, most of this code is just from the uh, Diplo package, which is how you, you know, subset um, a specific crime type. So what I'm doing is calling on a new object called ASB, standing for antisocial behavior, using the subset function and calling on the crime type from the SF package. Um, I'm also using the select function just to remove uh, a few variables that are not of interest to us. So if we run this code, we have a new package, uh, sorry, a new object called ASB. So let's have a quick look at how this looks. So we have um, our months where it was reported again, the location, but most importantly, we're only looking at the crime types now. And we still have that geometry, which is important for us. Um, <clears throat> so let's go ahead and map this like we did. In the same way, we're going to use the ggplot function, the annotation map tile, call on the geom sf and call on our data set called ASB. I am assigning this to a 
new variable called ASB map, just for clarity. And you'll see that now that's been added to our objects. In order to plot this, you can just simply type out the object, press uh, control enter or option enter, depending on if you're Windows or Mac user. And now we have a more, um, call it defined map of just ASB in Surrey. So you can see there's much less jittering. Um, and yeah, it's a great little way just if you're looking at one crime type. Cool, so I'm gonna give you guys uh, about, I'm gonna call it five, five to 10 minutes to run these activities on your own computer. Um, uh, there are, I want you guys to kind of look at how um, antisocial behavior compares to the crime type drugs. So I've left some like partial code here if you guys think to do this on your own computer. Um, follow the steps and in five minutes I'll come back and write in the rest of the code. Um, a question in the chat has been has been asked and it says if there's any restrictions on using LSOA, LSOA data. As we're using open recorded police statistics, in, in this instance there are no restrictions because this is a variable that comes free to download from uh, police.uk. It is a form of small area statistics used very, very widely by uh, government statistics. So most analysis is available to be, to be done by um, researchers, uni students, or elsewhere. All right, it's uh, been about five minutes. So I'm gonna go ahead and fill in the questions for the activity. So the first, first step was to subset the data for those crime types recorded as, as drugs. So all we'd have to do is simply use the subset function, call on our simple featured object, which we named SF, um, call on the variable crime type, and then call on the type of crime, which was named drugs. I don't think it's capital, maybe it's capital, might get an error. Yes, should be fine. Um, and then for step two, I've just asked you to assign this to a new variable called drugs. So we'll do the same thing, crime types, and we'll call this, uh, let me just make sure that it is, yeah, I think it is a capital, capital D, apologies. There we go. Capital D. That's the issue of R. R is uh, case sensitive, so it can be a little bit annoying. And there's no S at the end of crime types. There we go. And then uh, step three was to use ggplot to plot the point data over a base map. So we call on ggplot and then we use the um, annotation map tile function and we call on the geom sf function and the data set we want that we've just created is named drugs and now we have a or we will have a map of drugs and sorry so what can we say about the maps um i mean the amount of crimes produced in august 2020 um of drugs compared to antisocial behavior. We could say that there's probably much less uh, drug activity happening in this month compared to antisocial behavior. Is this suspected? Is this what we would have thought? These are questions that um, you, know, you should be asking yourself definitely as researchers, as uni students. Um, but obviously antisocial behavior is, a, is, a, is arguably a much more common crime type. So this is what we would expect to see. Um, yeah. <clears throat> that is topic one. We have explored the crime data set and we've shown how to produce some really um, intricate maps using, using ggplot and geom underscore sf. I'm going to move on to topic two in just a minute. Um, 
in this topic, we're going to be looking at how to use shapefiles to enhance our maps and why, why, well, what are shapefiles and why we use them. Um, so yeah, we'll just start in two minutes, just to make sure that everyone's kind of caught up from the last activities. So while you're waiting, you can just uh, load the packages needed for this topic. I'm just gonna address a question that I've seen in the Q&A, which have asked, are there any options to use different reference maps? For example, if we had smaller geographic areas, would it show buildings? Uh, yes, this is this is possible, but it would involve using um, additional data sets where you would then have to join that data set to your crime data set. And um, this is called as this is known as a street level mapping. And um, what you would do is use um, postcode addresses to identify uh, which buildings are where, and then you would need to basically join this to your data set. Um, I'm not too confident on this. I, I tried to run a project using um, streetlights a few years ago, and that was really interesting where I geocoded the uh, addresses to street lamps and compared these to different crime types. Um, so yeah, it's definitely possible to go smaller, but it just involves a lot more um, computation. All right, so what is a shapefile and, and why are we using it? Basically, shapefiles, um, they come under the SF package and they represent a geospatial vector that is used for GIS software. Now, shapefiles, they store both geographic location and um, it's associated with attribute information. The common like format in GIS is that it stores vector data. So this is our, our lines, our points and our polygons. And um, it stores them as a single feature class, which means it will store it as a single type. They tend not to mix up the points, lines, and polygons. So you never really work with um, all three in one. Um, now, shapefiles contain multiple files within them. You have, as listed here, .shx, .shp, .tbf, and the .prj. Um, not all completely necessary to know right now, but they do, but it's quite interesting. Um, we're going to be mainly using the .shp file, and this contains the geometry data. Um, I'm actually going to just show you here how that data looks like, and those four type files are um, situated. So again, I've already downloaded the shapefile for you, so there's no need to go ahead and do this. All is available here. Um, but as you can see, once I downloaded the shapefile, I had all of these um, attachments or files associated with them. We've got the projection, which contains the, the coordinates and the projection information. We have attribute information. We have the shape file itself, which um, contains the geometry data. And then we have the SHX, which is it's a bit complicated, but it's like the positional index of the feature geography, but not completely necessary to know right now. But yeah, let's go ahead and read in the shapefile for, for Surrey Heath, because that is the area we're, we're interested in. So reading the shapefile, we use the st underscore read function. And I'm calling this to a new um, object called shp underscore file. Um, now you might notice a double colon here. This, has, uh, this doesn't change the code. This is just letting you know that this function comes from this package. Um, so if we run this, We get this information. It says that we have an Esri shape file, which is a multi polygon and um, it is named English, oh, sorry, England LSOA 2001. Um, so, yeah, the first step would be to go ahead and plot this shape file. <clears throat> We're going to plot it as an empty shape file. So this is, there's no information about crime types here. This is simply um, just an empty representation of all the LSOAs in Surrey Heaths. And this is really similar to how we plot the crime data. We're going to do this using ggplot and using geom underscore sf function again. And we call on the data, call the data set. 
we run this, again, give it a minute. And now we have an image of each LSOA from Surrey Heath, um, all of which obviously like bounding each other. Um, yeah, this is really useful because now with this geometry attribute, we'll be able to plot crime more efficiently and more accurately to each LSOA. And we'll be able to identify the boundaries. In topic one, we just had the area in a hole and we didn't have all these boundaries and all these areas. So um, much more efficient in terms of like the introduction of, of like policy amendment and figuring out uh, what crimes have happened where. We can also use the head function to just view this file to see what we're dealing with. But we've already had a look at this. So yeah, we have, we have the name, the code and the geometry. Now this geometry variable is important because this is the variable that we have in our crime data set. So what we need to do is somehow join these two data sets together so that we can plot the crime data set on top of this. Um, there is more information about um, shape files, but yeah, I'm not gonna, not gonna read that now. It's just kind of inform you that this is an empty shape file and there's no, there's no context provided yet. Um, yeah, we're gonna go ahead and join these two data sets. <clears throat> Firstly, we can view the geometry available by using the st underscore geometry uh, function, which I think is also from the SF package. Again, if you run this, it just tells you that this is a multi-polygon. Uh, this is, <coughs> sorry. So this is still a polygon file, it's just that because there are multiple LSOAs, it's naming this as a multi-polygon um, for specifically for 55 LSOAs. Um, and yeah, this is, function is just how you can uh, contain the geometries of, a, of the list. <clears throat> so how do we go ahead and join these two, these two uh, data sets together? Your first step is to group the crimes per LSOA. So now we're walking back to our crime data set. The original crime data set contains the, the individual count of repeated crime types across LSOAs. Therefore, the LSOAs are repeated multiple times. And this is because you would expect to see multiple crime types in one LSOA. If you think back to that first image we made where there was a lot of overlap, that is why, because there are multiple crime types happening in that one area. But in order to highlight how many crimes have occurred in each LSOA in each area, we can count the crimes per area and obtain like a group statistics. Um, so in order to do this, we can just use some simple data wrangling, some simple data manipulation to go ahead and do this. Um, again, I'm gonna create a new object, this time called crimes grouped by LSOA. Um, I tend to create new objects as I go. Some people tend to just override their original, but I like to keep things separate so that there's, um, yeah, so I don't override anything and don't cause any confusion. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so we're going to, again, use the assignment operator to call on our crime data set. And then we're going to group the LSOA code and then count each crime within each LSOA. So this code does that all at once, which is a really nifty bit of code. Um, and if we do this, you see that we have this new variable or a new data set here called crimes, crimes grouped by LSOAs containing just two variables. So let's have a quick look at what this looks like. As you can see, we have the LSOA and the count of crime within each area. And that's brilliant because now that means that we can go ahead and join this to our original data set, I mean, to the shape file. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and merge the shape file to our crime data set. To do this, we're gonna use a little function called left underscore join. Um, the left join function basically returns all the rows of the table on the left side of the join and matches the rows for the table on the right side of the join. Um, 
So what I'm doing here is creating a new object again called uh, Surrey LSOA using that left join function. Now we call on our first uh, object of interest, which is the empty shape file. And then we call on the crimes group by LSOA, which we have just made. And now we call on uh, two variables that, that match within each other. And we want to basically join these by, by the codes, right? By the LSOA code. So in the shape file, the LSOA variable name is code. And in the crimes group by LSOA, the, um, the LSOA variable is named this. I'm saying LSOA a lot, apologies. Um, <laughs> but let's go ahead and create this, this file. Um, brilliant, so that's being worked successfully. And you can see we have 55 observations and five variables. Let's have a quick look at what we're looking at here. So now we've got six features and four fields. So now we have that count variable added to our empty LSOA, which is really useful. Um, and we see that the geometry has matched up effectively. Um, the, these extra functions are just ways to explore the data set a bit more. I've already shown you what SC geometry does. Uh, this just shows you the type of um, vector data you have. We, we have a multi-polygon. And then we have the STBOX, which um, basically obtains the object values as like specific units. Um, it's not that important really, but, um, but yeah, now we can move on to mapping this data. And again, we use the same kind of code we used in um, topic one. So we call on ggplot, we are going to add a base map. So that involves adding the annotation map a tile. And then we're going to call on geom underscore SF. And we're calling on that new data set called Surrey LSOA. And you use the aesthetics function to fill the, the map with the crime count. That new variable was called count. And we're just using alpha of 0 0.05. That just decreases the transparency. And then we uh, use the scale underscore fill gradient just to um, also just improve the aesthetics. So if we run this, just have to give it 10 seconds or so. As I said, it's all a bit slow. But now we have a much more detailed and intricate map of the crime types in Surrey. Uh, we have this like really nice gradiated um, x-axis and we have a base map and we have some transparency. So this is a much more uh, readable and, you know, effective map if you were to um, study specific crime types. Um, I'd also like to just introduce a different way how you can plot maps, which is by using the tmaps package. Uh, the tmaps package basically allows you to create theoretic maps. Um, there are two types. There's the the view function, which is a like an ordinary um, image like we've just seen and then there's the plot function which is oh sorry wrong way around the view image is the interactive map and the plot is an ordinary image so in order to change this map that we've just seen into an interactive map all you need to do is use the tmap underscore mode function to change this to view so run this you see that tmap has now been set to interactive viewing and we can run the same code. Um, <clears throat> probably it's not the same code. We use the tm underscore shape function from the SF package. Call on, sorry, LSOA. We use tm underscore fill to, to count that crime type. And I've just set the borders to green and um, again, load the transparency so we can see the, the, the borders. So if we run this, we now have an interactive map, which means we can see a bit more nicely which um, LSOA, LSOA um, has the highest crime type. As you can see, this one here does. Um, we can also, you know, zoom in and zoom out, uh, which is really interesting because you can put that in location to, to London and whatnot. But yeah, that's a really uh, fun way to, to make maps a bit more um, 
interactive. Uh, the last little topic I'd like to talk about in this section is uh, classification methods. Now, how can we better visualize these counts? How can we take it one step further? Well, count data does not equally represent the population distribution at hand, but the T maps allows you to alter the characteristics of these thematic maps. Um, that is this function here, the TM shape. Um, and what we can basically do is create um, different styles and the different styles result in different binning techniques. A uh, binning technique is just a way that the crimes have been grouped. So in our previous map, I don't know why I got rid of it, I'll run, I'll run it again. Um, you'll see that the crime count, the, the binning has automatically been done for you. We've got one to 10, 11 to 20, um, and so on, so on. But you might not um, necessarily want this binning technique. You might want to do something completely different. And there are classification methods in place to allow you to do so. Um, so in this next uh, chunk of code, I've gone ahead and used three different techniques or three different classification methods. I've looked at the k-means, I've looked at Jenks, and I've looked at standard deviation. I'm not going to go into too much detail about what these means because it's quite mathsy and quite um, uh, statistics based. But in short, the Jenks and the k-means um, they tend to minimize with, within group distances. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, I mean you can have a read of what these definitions mean a bit more um, thoroughly if you'd like, but I'm just gonna go ahead and show you how we can change the style of the maps. So very similar to what we have done just up here by adding a style function to change this classification method. So what I've done here, I've um, created three different maps, adding in a style function and calling on the different classifications. I've got k-means, I've got jenks, and I've got standard deviation. I've also assigned these to their own objects, um, just again, to make things a little neater. So if we run all three, you see A has been added to our environment, B has been added to our environment, and C has been added to our environment. Now you could simply plot these maps by simply typing in one of them, and typing in A. And here we have a different way that our crime counts have been classified. You can have a look at B. And again, you see how the classification methods have changed. We're now looking at 1 to 7 and 38 to 53, um, and so on, so on. And then we have C, which is the standard deviation. Um, now, there are many different ways to classify your data. These, these are not limited. There, are, there is a whole list to choose from, but you must think carefully about the choices you make as this might affect your, um, your conclusions and your interpretations. And yeah, whatever kind of one you do use, I'd recommend some sort of consistency in your maps. Like you can't compare a, a standard deviation map to a k-means map because the way that these have been clustered is very different, right? Um, but yeah, let's just say that you wanted to map all three together to show how different these can be. We can use the um, tmaps arrange function to do so. So what I'm going to do is first change our viewing, our mode, back to the basic image mode. So I want to get rid of that interaction. Now we see tmap mode has been set to plotting. So we're no longer going to have an interactive map. And I'm going to use tmap arrange, um, plot in the A, B, and C maps that we created. So that is the uh, Jenks, the, no, sorry, k-means, the Jenks, and the standard deviation in, in one image in one map, which is a really nifty function. It's going to take a while because it's three maps. And there we go. We have an uh, image with the three maps and the three different classification methods. And you can see huge differences in how these have been classified. You can see changes in the color, color contrast and how different LSOAs have now 
increased and decreased in the in the crime count. Um, so yeah, so just whichever ones you do use, just make sure you um, understand the interpretations of these and what they might mean to your crime counts. Um, the, uh, now we're going to move on to looking at using um, categorical variables, which is a type of you can use um, small multitudes basically to, to plot maps um, using like categorical variables. I'm just gonna skip most of this because it's not too important right now, but again, you can read this in your, in your own time. But uh, let's just say that you wanted to plot each LSOA individually and in that you didn't want them bounded together. You wanted to plot them side by side. Uh, we could do this by using the TM facets function here. So I'm calling on the name variable, which is the name of the LSOA, and just applying some um, aesthetics. I'm also using the TM layout function just to make the image a little bit uh, readable. And if we run this, we'll see that we have a much, again, we're gonna have to give it a minute. Don't worry about that warning sign. Um, this is just because we have quite low crime counts, but if you was using, uh, higher crime counts, this wouldn't be an issue. But yeah, now we have each LSOA and their, um, and their shape, but you know, how useful is this to you? How, how useful is having each one separated out together? But it might be more useful if you had some sort of categorical variable present in your data set. Um, maybe if you had um, like, the deprivation level, you know, if you was using the IMD, which is a scale from one to 10, if you had this variable present, which is possible to join, you could then use the TM facets to plot each area uh, depending on its deprivation, which might be really interesting. <clears throat> I'm just gonna skip the additional fe features. This is just uh, kind of for, for, for you guys, if you wanna know about how you can make your maps a bit more aesthetically pleasing, so there's ways to change the style, ways to change the legends. And you can also add cool things like compasses, scale bars, and grids. In fact, I'm just going to run this one because I really like the way this one looks. Um, I'm not sure. There we go. Uh, so yeah, you can get like really cool little things added. You can get a compass, a scale bar, a grid, um, which just makes your maps a bit more fun to, to read. Um, but yeah. I'm pretty sure that is the end of activity um, topic two. So I've been talking for a while, so I'll give you guys five to ten minutes to explore activity two. There isn't too much to do for this one. This is more just exploring those different classification methods. Um, and yeah, I want you guys to have a look at exploring the B class and H class methods. These are just different types. Um, they're known as hierarchical clustering and bag clustering. Um, and yeah, follow these steps in the activity and I'll come back in, I'll call it five minutes and then run through the answers with you. Um, there's no specific questions about activity two. So I'm just gonna go ahead and um, answer the, uh, fill in the activity question. Um, I've seen a few questions in the Q&A, but I'm going to come back to those at the, at the end. So, yeah, let's go ahead and have a look at these activity questions. You were first asked to explore the methods B-class and H-class, and then to assign these to um, separate objects. Let's call them H and B, right? Uh, so to do so, let's start with the uh, H-class first. So we'll just call this H. Um, you use the TM tm underscore shape function and call on your object. We're using sorry LSOA, uh, no quotes because it's an, it's an object. Um, and then we'll be calling on the fill function in which instance we want the count. And then we want the style. So the style we wanted was the H class. Uh, there's more information about these if you use the help function on, on the right, or you can use, um, help in the code as well. So yeah, that's our H class category. Um, 
and we'll just go ahead and create our B cluster as well. Again, this will be really simple. So all you have to do is use your sorry LSOA, LSOA um, object. We use count to, to fill this in. And then we have our style, which in this case, I'm gonna use the B cluster. Uh, so let's go ahead and run these. HMB, yep. Uh, I probably should have called that something else as we did have a previous map called B, but that's fine, it's just been overrided. Um, and now I've asked you to um, plot these together using TMAP arrange. So you could plot these individually as, as shown, uh, but yeah, this is really simple to do this. You just use the H and B maps that we created under the uh, TMAP arrange function. And you'll see that there's some computing going on because this is a more um, mathematical clustering method. But yeah, a classification method. So here we have two new classification methods with, um, we see that there's different bins that have been, been created. So again, it's kind of really important to discuss the implications of these, why they're high accounts in certain LSOAs when using different classification methods. Um, and then uh, question three, I've asked you to plot an interactive map using the B class method by changing the command in the tmap underscore, underscore mode function. So again, to do this, we simply tell R that we want to look at the interactive mode, which is done by using view. And that's been now set to the interactive viewing. And then we can go ahead and um, make that map for that again. So we can use sorry LSOA. LSOA. Um, we're going to use the count again. And we can choose the style, which is the cluster. Now, if we run this map again, after setting the map to interactive, we now have an interactive um, B cluster classification map of our crime count. Um, so yeah, I hope that's been helpful in helping you kind of explore these different methods and um, what this effect can have on, on your work. Uh, but yes, finally, we're going to move on to our last topic, topic three, which involves um, looking at the differences between crime rate and crime count and the effect that this might have on your work. Um, so first step is to obviously load the relevant packages. Most of these have been loaded in topics one and two, but it doesn't hurt to load them again. Um, so for this topic, we're going to be looking at uh, population statistics. <clears throat> so crime data is not entirely accurate of population density. So whilst what we've done have might whilst topics one and two have been really useful in, in, in like identifying certain patterns, this point level open crime data is rarely used to like in the isolation for detailed analysis. For one thing, as we talked about yesterday, the data points are geomasked. And that, this means that the points are highly likely to be overlapped, give a skewed picture of the distribution. And this links back to um, the question that was in the Q&A in that some of these points might have actually taken place in one LSOA, but have been shifted and geomasked to another. Maybe it was sitting on a border and had just been automatically moved. And this might drastically change your, um, your, you know, your crime count in one LSOA. But there are ways to, to go around this, um, such as jittering or applying census-based data. Um, um, jittering techniques are available in the additional topics. Uh, given the time, I'll see if we have, have time to go through that. But we're going to be using um, the second method, which is applying census-based data. Um, so what I have done is obtain some statistics from Infuse uh, from the UK Data Service. Uh, the data is available in this folder called Census Population. And we're going to be specifically looking at this uh, CSV file here. Um, now, Infuse is really tricky to use. And I have attached a, I'll just show you now. 
I will attach this Word document which has detailed how I've collected the crime data, which can be seen here. I've detailed how to collect the shape files, and I've also given some instructions on how to collect the census data. But it is very um, tedious, it's, it's very, very clicky, so don't worry too much about that now, we'll just take way too much time, just use the data that is available. But what I have done is specifically selected the um, workday population and the residential population from, from Surrey. Uh, now you might be asking what exactly is workday and residential population? Well, in short, the residential population reflects the usual activity of an area, whereas the workday population reflects who works there, who resides in the area, and those that either work from home or who do not work. So you might have, um, yes, you might expect an increased workday population as opposed to a residential population. Um, but yeah, we're gonna look at how we can use these two to apply some more um, context to our crime data. So the first step is just to read in this data set um, using a new object called uh, pop, just stands for population. And we can use the read underscore CSV function to do so. Um, the slice function basically removes, um, I think it's the first three rows of data because they weren't, um, they were just titles and not actual variables. And I've also selected only the columns of interest. Again, I'm using janitor to clean the names uh, to make them all underscore. I mean, all lowercase, sorry. And um, I've also gone ahead and renamed some of the variables because they have been given silly names like the work day and residential population, they have silly um, numbers. So I've just renamed these so they're a bit clearer for, for us in analysis. Um, and I've also had to mutate and convert these variables to numeric because they are additionally read as character variables, but, but they are numeric. So yeah, this is a mutate app function which allows you to do that um, across multiple variables. So yeah, let's go ahead and run this. And then we can have a quick look at our data set again using the head function. So as you can see, we have our geocode, the area that it falls in, the population density, which was another variable that I added, but not completely necessary for this workshop. We have the population count from the workday uh, population, and then we have the residential population uh, looking at the count. So let's... Um, so our next step is now to join this population data set to our Surrey LSOO, which includes the um, count of crime from each LSOO. So we want to um, merge these again so that we have additional information or attribute information added to our Surrey um, shapefile. So again, to do this, we use that left join function and um, we're calling on our first data set, which is our shapefile with all the information that we made in topic two. And we're calling on pop, which is that census data set that includes those two variables of interest. And we join these by the code and geocode, which is just um, the LSOA. So let's go ahead and do that. And um, let's have a look at what we've got now. As you can see, we now have the population count and the pop population, sorry, the workday population and the residential population added to our shapefile as, as um, including that original count. In fact, I might just uh, open this up so you can see it a bit clearer. So it's a lot of variables. We'll take a minute, sorry. Yeah, so yeah, we have that count that we've added in. Now we have the population count from the workday and the residential, as well as our geometry files. Um, don't worry about these clipboards, they're just, because the list of geometries are too long for that one area that they, that they just list it like that, but it's not an issue. Um, but yeah, now we have these variables, we can go ahead and start to figure out how to calculate the crime rate. Now, a crime rate is basically calculated by dividing the number of reported crimes by the total population and then multiplying by 100,000. 
in short, there's a little um, equation there for you. So don't get too confused. It's really not too difficult. You take the count, you take your population of interest, and then we divide it by 1,000. Um, so for our data set, I'm going to start by looking at the workday population. So in order to create this count, um, all you need to do is divide the raw count by the workday population and times it by 1,000. Um, you might be thinking, why are we using 1,000? Isn't that a really random number? Well, this is actually the um, average population of an LSOA in England. So this number might vary depending on uh, the boundary you're looking at, the country you're looking at, and so on and so on. So what I've done is, again, assigned a, I'm going to keep the same name, sorry, LSOA, and used the mutate function to create a new variable called crime rate. This is how you would do that. Um, mutate, I believe, is found in the Dipler package, I want to say. And yeah, we use brackets to calculate this new variable. Um, so we assign that workday population count and the count and we times by 1000 and we'll get our crime rate. So if we go ahead and run this and we'll have a quick look at the data set again, I'll just view it here so it's a little bit clearer. We should have a new variable that indicates the crime count from the workday population. And here we have it. We have this, um, now we have our rate of crime per workday population. Um, so what, what can we do with that? What, what's, how can we start to explore this and map data? We're gonna use pretty much same, of the same um, functions that we use in topics one to two, uh, following ggplot and TM, TM maps. So let's start with ggplot. Again, we're gonna call on a, a base map because I wanna make this um, a bit more readable, a bit more context. We call on GMSF, apply our story, LSOA dataset, fill in by the crime rate, apply some aesthetics, and you'll get a map that looks like this with our crime rate if it loads. There we go. Um, so what you could do is kind of compare this crime rate to the original crime count that we had and see the differences and see um, which, which areas have higher or lower counts. Um, now I'm going to show you just how to do this with the TM shapes. We've already done this, so I won't explain it too much. But yeah, we're just going to use TM shapes, fill this with crime rate, and we're just going to use the, the quantile style, which is like the most basic one. It's not, um, it's not like the standard deviation methods that we use. So yeah, and now we have this really cool crime rate map, which is also interactive because I hadn't changed the T map mode. But that's all right. Um, and yeah, now we have a crime rate map. Um, cool. So yeah, the last thing that I'd like to just talk about, I'll spend a few minutes on this, is um, cartograms and, and how we can use this with ggplot. Uh, a cartogram is basically a type of map where different geographic areas are modified based on a variable associated to those areas. Um, there are two types of cartograms, contiguous and non-contiguous. This basically just means whether you want your LSOAs bounded or not. Um, quite similar to like the, the small mul multitudes that we looked at and having them split up. Um, I'm going to be looking at sharing common borders. So I want to have all the LSOAs in, in Surrey loaded together. Um, in order to create a cartogram, you need to basically join the statistical and the geographical data. So what you need to do is um, using the modified SF object, which is our Surrey LSOA, which has everything we need. And you need to pass the values of interest. You need to apply a weight value, um, which indicates some sort of uh, population. So in this instance, I'm just going to look at the workday population. And I'm assigning this to a new variable called cart. 
you'll get a mean size error for iteration. This is it's just doing its calculations. Um, a cartogram is basically just another type of thematic map, map by, by the way. It's one that was mentioned in yesterday's um, talk. And you'll see how this can look and why this might or might not be effective for crime data. It might be more effective for, um, I'd probably say something like um, maybe travel or, or weather, but you'll see why. And yeah, now we can go ahead and create this plot. And you'll see, we'll get something that looks like this. This is um, an empty map. We haven't assigned the Surrey variable to this. Uh, this is simply a cartogram of the LSOAs and Surreys. So let's go ahead and add our population count. That is that weighted variable we just calculated. You do this by simply applying anesthetic and um, using the fill function. So we're on this, you'll now see a map, a cartogram with our uh, crime count across, um, sorry, which is pretty interesting. Um, it depends, you know, like how readable is this map? How reproducible is it for you and your work? Um, and you can also go ahead and basically add more aesthetics to this. You can add a title, you can add, change the colors, uh, you can add subtitles. I think one thing to think about when creating maps is to consider um, color blindness. That's a, that's a huge factor when making these maps. You know, how readable is this to people who are colorblind? Um, there are color palettes in place that allow you to change this um, in this variable here. So if you search in the help function, you can have a look and see what's, what's best. Um, yeah, so now we've just finished up. Now you've learned how to create a crime rate and how you can go ahead and plot this. Uh, we'll move on to activity three. I'll give you guys five, five minutes to have a go at this and then we'll work through this together. Um, but what I want you to do is basically replicate what I've just done with the workday population, but, but to have a go on the residential population now. So it's the exact same code, but you're just changing a few variables to, to calculate the crime rate from the residential population. Um, there's a message in the chat saying that there's an error message, can't find cartogram card. That is probably because I didn't tell you to install it or load it. Uh, you would probably, you need to install the package um, cartogram. You can see it on line 125 here. So you just, if you haven't installed it yet, just run install packages and type in cartogram. Let me know if that works for you. And then make sure to, to load the library as well. Uh, but yeah, we're coming towards the end of this, this talk. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish up this activity, but um, we might run over a, a few minutes while I answer last minute questions. But if you could, uh, before you leave or when you leave to do the do the survey evaluation, I mean a lot for, for me, and, me and my colleagues because it, helps us to know what's uh, what you guys want to see next. But um, yeah, let's let's go ahead and finish off this, the last activity. So your first step was to calculate the crime rate. Um, it's, again, remembering that calculation, you have the count variable and you divide this by your um, variable of interest, depending on your population. So I've asked you to have a look at the residential population. Is that right? Um, which was called pop count res. And we're going to be timing it by 1000 as well. Um, was it the residential? Yeah, it was residential. Great. Now we have that um, new variable added. You'll see now we have 11 variables, which means we have a crime rate um, named crime rate two for our residential population. Uh, so now we can go ahead and plot this using ggplot. Um, so you're going to simply call on your data set named, sorry, LSOA, LSOA, keep saying it wrong. Um, and then we're going to fill this using the crime rate, but two, because this is relevant to um, the residential population. And now we can go ahead and run this and we'll have a nifty little 
if it loads. GD plot of our residential population. Um, and then we can do basically the exact same with our uh, using T maps, which is a, just a different variation. And um, we want to fill by. Even I've forgotten crime rate. Crime rate two. Is that right? Yep. Boom. There we go. And there we have our more interactive map using a different package, which is the T-maps. Um, I tend to pre prefer T-maps to, to ggplot, but I have realized that ggplot has more options in terms of um, editing aesthetics and kind of just making it look a bit, a bit prettier, but personal choice, right? And now I've asked you to uh, compare how the workday versus the residential population looks like. So we can go ahead and do this by uh, creating two new objects. I'm just going to call them E and F for, for sake. <laughs> um, and we're going to fill this again by the crime underscore rate two. And or just one. And then we'll compare this to the crime underscore rate two, which is relevant to the residential population. So we go ahead and run these. I've also changed the alpha to 0 0.3, but you can change this and mess around and see what will happen to, to the aesthetics. And now we can go ahead and plot these two together, um, simply using tmap arrange. And we'll have this nice little map that hopefully Perfect. And now we have two maps that show the crime rate compared to the workday population and the residential population. You can see that there are differences in the two in that there is a much lower, uh, well, there's a yeah, there's much lower um, maximum crime rate, crime rate for the residential population. So what does that say about um, comparing crimes against different populations? You know, if you were to use the census, you could also, um, have a look at ethnicity and demographic and see how crime rates vary across the two, which would be really interesting. Um, and it gives you scope to, you know, develop research questions and really ask questions about how crime um, changes among, among our society, among our demographic. And um, lastly, I've had a little code just to show you, you or help you to explore the cartograms. So it's really simple. You fill in the ggplot with the cart function, and then you fill um, using the pop count res. Uh, you can have a look and do the workday as one as well, but choice is up to you. And now we have this really nifty little cartogram um, of our uh, residential population across Surrey Heath. And yeah, that draws conclusion to to this talk. Um, I hope that it has been beneficial. We do have a few minutes left, so I'm willing to take questions or um, in fact, you're welcome to hang around for, you know, another five minutes while I, while I look at the additional tasks. Um, there are also all the codes and solution I've put available in one R markdown file. So if you want to avoid all of the um, the extra information I put in the others, then, then all the code can kind of just be found here, as well as the answers from the activities. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna just talk through the additional topics, not necessarily go through them, but um, so in the um, additional topics, I'll just quickly show you what's here so you can go ahead and do this in your own time. But um, I mentioned that you can produce maps using ggmaps, which is using Google's API. Um, and this basically allows you to create a, call it more realistic base map um, on top of your maps. But unfortunately, in order to do this, you need to set up a connection to Google API, and that could take quite a while. So I've included a separate um, RMD script, which gives you a really step-by-step -step instructions on how to contain a Google API. 
um it does take a while so this is only if you like you know if you're that if you're if you love maps that much then go ahead and, and go for it um just a warning it does require a credit card but it doesn't actually charge you um it's a it's a very strange system i think it's for like security purposes but yeah you can have a go at it, exploring different areas in well across google maps across anywhere in the world and um the code for that is all here and i've provided some aesthetics to that as well um another interesting part is the binning the data which was um kind of what i mentioned before but yeah this um this with most crime data, you are, um, and mo with most um, simple features, your your geometry, so that is that combined x, y, and coordinates are combined. But sometimes you might want to split these up and have them separate so that you can start to uh, bin your data a bit more effectively. Now there is a function that was created um, via this GitHub link right here. So I, I did not write this, but if you run this function and then um, this basically allows you to separate your longitude and latitudes from your geometries and you can produce a more um effective gg maps in, in short and it might look something like this um and there's an error of course uh, i'll have a look at that and i'll um i'll update the code I'm not sure why there's an error we'll see and then I've included some more interactive information about the uh, leaflet package, which we didn't get to look at, but this is just a different way to make interactive maps. Uh, we looked mainly at the Tmaps package, but this is just another option. And I've left some more um, resources to jittering and using ST intersect. But yeah, that uh, draws conclusion to this talk. I realize we're five minutes over now. I'm not sure who is still present. But thank you all for um, attending.